Great, so now that we've done one element, two elements, uh, now we can go and say, okay, let's let's see what it takes to write a finite element program where we have lots and lots and lots of elements. And let's look at that in this 1D example. Once we're done with this, we almost going to get to a point where we're going to close on the one-dimensional file elements, and then we can extend towards two-dimensional file elements and really extend what we've learned beyond. Um, so that is that is really exciting what's lying ahead for us, so that we can then uh, really make sure that we can reflect on what we've done in 1D, think critically how to extend it to 2D and 3D, without really having to go through all the details of the mathematics but that we just can really reason about it quite sensibly. But before we do that, let's look at what this 1D file uh, holds for us. Okay. So, well, the reality is, is if you want to write a systematic file element program, we first like to really like to go and say, let's try to write small functions that takes this big problem that is a file element program and breaks it into smaller chunks. And that is really the how I any of these projects that you would, you would tackle that's maybe a little bit longer would work. And that's what you've also learned in NPR 2 and 3. If you have a complex problem, break it down into a lot of small, smaller problems where the smaller problems are solvable, and then you pack them together like a puzzle to create a complex picture or a complex, solve a complex problem. Okay. So let's consider the case where we have a, a bar that's length at x0, force a thousand newtons, and the right edge at x equals to 1. Okay. Area it varies linearly. Uh, so we have a thick, um, uh, oh sorry, there's just a typo here, there should be plus one. The area is essentially thin at the one side, it gets thicker towards the other side, with the x plus one side. And then we have a Young's module of 202 gigapascal. Okay, so that is that is essentially first step. So what you could do is to say, let's write down an expression for our constitutive of our Young's modulus. So that's essentially this value that you're just coding in yet in gigapascal, but you just convert it down to Pascal as a function of psi. Okay. So, although this is a constant, if I plug in any psi, I will get out a value um, of 210. Obviously, this could also become then later on a function of psi. So, we can have some very good materials as well. We can check with the shape functions. Uh, we can write small little utility functions for them, say n1 to n3. These are shape functions that we have. We can construct the derivatives of the shape functions. That's essentially what we do here. So now we're going to the shape function with derivatives. Um, so this is just the numerical version of going about this, all using NumPy, essentially, with a sort of numerical approach. No SumPy is being important here. Um, and that is, this is how most of the typical finite, finite filament approaches would work. Okay. Construct the function returns the mapping between x and psi. That's our essentially our uh, isobarometric formulation that we have here. So give it the coordinates. Yeah, so the coordinates for uh, in x and then at psi, and then I will pop the x value for that given psi. So that's essentially what we have there. Um, construct the function returns the local displacement field as a function of psi, local nodal displacements. Okay, so this is again. Use and they are known, specified psi, give me the nodal values, and I would be able to return for you, uh, you, at that specific value of psi. Okay. We're setting up the dn, uh, the psi matrix. In this case, uh, essentially, in this case, it's just a row vector. Okay. Let's note that this, this is a, this a vector inside a, another vector, so it's a matrix. Okay. In this case, a 1 by 3 matrix. The x to psi is my relationship between x and psi. I have changes in those two worlds. My b vector is telling me essentially what, what's going on uh, in terms of the derivative of this with respect to spatial variable x. This is what this is. Area we can find is part, uh, part of the problem, the function of psi. So everything that we define here is really a function of psi. And this is done, as we know, for the integration, to make integration easier. Okay. Now we can go about and say, fantastic, let's get the integrant. Yeah. So here I compute the integrant for that matrix, for that element. This quadratic element is that, and there's my term that comes out. So this k term is just the integrant that we're computing. Um, and then we can say, okay, now we can go about integrating this. 
here are some examples of uh, check here what is this quickly the oh yeah just so a lot of zeros in here a lot of these values just so that uh, we can stack them into rows so for a two by two rule we use the first two values here and we have the associated weights so if we have a uh, uh, higher order rule uh, Three point rule than that, but we'll have and here's the associated weights. So, yes, we're just stacking a matrix with all the rows of all the values in there. So, that's why you see a lot of these zeros. So just you want to access them for the two point rule, you want to access these two values. It's just uh, one way of doing it. Alternatively, one could have stored this into a dictionary and then just stored whatever values were required. You don't have to have paired it with a lot of zeros. Okay, so that's something simple there. Now we can go and say, let's complete the local uh, stiffness matrix. Uh, supply for that the local nodal coordinates so that's important to supply that and then we can start going and do a gas curvature integration okay so typically you might even want to specify the number of gas points and then uh, use that okay so that's depending on how you want to approach this um, as this is something that you could also specify here at the moment uh, gas curvature points is hard-coded okay